Kia ora. Um, so what I want to do is uh, talk about imperialism, capitalism, colonialism, um, the Israeli state and occupied Palestine, uh, and do it all in 15 minutes uh, and go. <laughs> um, so thousands of years ago, um, the Romans expanded their influence through military campaigns and the exercise of diplomatic power until they controlled a significant portion of the world known to them. Even before then, the Akkadian, um, Assyrian and Bar Babylonian empires had likewise controlled vast swathes of land and people. Capitalism, by comparison, is a system that's only grown to its present Eurocentric dominance in the last 500 or so years. Um, and on the Romans, uh, the scholarly contention about whether they waged wars out of genuine fear for their safety, um, for their borders, uh, or for reasons of expansion, for the sake of expansion, uh, for resource exploitation or individualistic pursuit of military glory. Uh, but nonetheless, um, Roman citizens lived uh, within and greatly benefited from a social structure that lionized combat, stoked national pride, and was willing to subjugate almost every neighbor. Uh, so whatever those motivations, uh, it's clear, hopefully from uh, as I've laid these things out, um, that empires and social currents that uphold and are complicit in imperialism have predated capitalism by a significant margin. That being said, though, imperialism in the capitalist era has some specific traits, and as socialists, we have a particular analysis of those traits, which are important and relevant. Um, so I'm going to ask this time of you um, this evening to consider imperialism in the contemporary capitalist context. Uh, so in particular, um, as for the title of um, this intro, um, we're going to look at the intersection of imperialism, capitalism, and colonialism um, and center on occupied Palestine as an example of that intersection of forces. Um, so let's start with the Ottoman Empire, uh, which arose just before mercantilism around the 14th century. Um, so already shrinking prior to World War I, the Ottomans fought and lost alongside Germany and others, um, and much of their territory was occupied by the victors of World War I. That territory included Palestine, uh, land border bordering the Mediterranean Sea, and the Victorian League of Nations, sorry, the Victorious League of Nations, handed Britain the mandate to govern. I touch on this history because I think it's important to acknowledge that Palestinians have been under imperial occupation for centuries. And I want to acknowledge that there was struggle against the British occupation just back then, just as there is struggle against Israeli occupation now. In case British occupation rather than liberation wasn't insult enough for Palestinian um, people, the British in 1917 had publicly taken a Christian Zionist position that stated a desire at some unspecified future time to, quote, establish in Palestine a national home for the Jewish people. On paper, claiming that, quote, nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of not existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Uh, but in reality, demonstrating an utter lack of insight into how this might be achieved without the disruption of connection to land of those who lived there already. As the Zionist ideology spread, many European Jews displaced by the horrors of Nazism found refuge, refuge in Palestine. Under British governance, there was escalating conflict between Zionist immigrants and Palestinians with some Jewish Zionist groups being identified as terrorist organizations for their activities, which included the planting of bombs in the basement uh, of the King David Hotel in Jerusalem, which killed 91 people. Um, the British ultimately withdrew from Palestine, but, ultimate, uh, but despite the United Nations plans for a partition into Jewish and non-Jewish Palestinian territories, quote, under economic union, uh, so uh, a single sort of unified nation with different... Um, uh, ethnic or cultural um, regions. Uh, on the 14th of May, 1948, a group um, then known as the Jewish Agency for Palestine declared, quote, the establishment of a Jewish state in Eretz Israel to be known as the State of Israel. Within minutes, USA President Harry Truman expressed his support. This government, I quote again uh, Truman, uh, this government has been informed that a Jewish state has been proclaimed in Palestine in recognition has been requested by the provisional government thereof. The United States recognizes the provisional government as the de facto authority in the new state 
of Israel. Since then, through a series of wars and annexations, the state of Israel has expanded to occupy all of the territory bordering Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt. Nominally, the international community acknowledges that Israel is a foreign occupying force in some of this territory and identifies the massively unequal rights of Israelis and Palestinians as being a system of apartheid. In reality, however, the majority of the world's most vocal leaders do much to assist Israel and little to alleviate the plight of the Palestinians. Uh, Chris McGreal writes for The Guardian, quote, what happened to the Palestinians who were living there? About 700,000 Palestinians were expelled or fled, about 85% of the Arab population of the territory captured by Israel, and were never allowed to return. Palestinians called the exodus and eradication of much of the society inside Israel the Nakba, or catastrophe, and it remains the traumatic event at the heart of their modern history. This expansion of territory and oppression of the Palestinian people serves the state of Israel in a number of ways. On the one hand, the cry never again is raised as a statement that Israel exists to ensure the Jewish people are never again subjected to a Holocaust. On the other hand, the state itself is not necessary to ensure such, and the scale of misery and death inflicted on an indigenous population in support of that cry is itself a genocide. Looking further then, uh, we see some other themes that may be familiar to socialists. The current Israeli government, led by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, has been described as far right. Utilising criteria for identifying fascism uh, from an earlier talk, uh, it's certainly easier to identify, or easier, sorry, it is certainly easy to identify the Israeli state as meeting uh, these four uh, out of five criteria. Anti-egalitarian, hierarchical and authoritarian, exclusionary and othering, and violent and vindictive. So that a further justification for the Jewish people returning to the land occupied by um, the Israeli state now is biblical, um, gives some justification for the state also meeting the fifth and final criteria, uh, which is glorifying of an idealized past. Um, with that in mind, we might usefully examine the role of fascism in an Israeli context. Certainly, ultra-nationalism helps to unite a people against a common perceived enemy. Uh, my one hesitation at this point is um, in, in applying the fascist label is that I'm not aware of a capitalist origin of the early Zionist movement, and I'd be very interested in um, thoughts about that uh, in discussion later. Uh, regardless of the fascistic or otherwise nature of Israel, the oppression of Palestinians uh, provides a useful labour pool for Israel. Quoting Karl Marx from Capital, in the interests of the so-called national wealth, the capitalist seeks for artificial means to ensure the poverty of the people. It is not by accident that I pull that quote from the chapter of Capital, which addresses colonisation. A reserve army of labour is useful for capitalists as it increases the dispensability of those currently employed and decreases the likelihood that those newly employed will fight for improved employment conditions. The unemployment rate in Israel is 3%, and the Israeli economy, uh, sorry, economy Ministry uh, has said, quote, the existence of 14,000 vacancies in manufacturing was creating a barrier to economic growth. Uh, compare Israel's relatively low unemployment against um, unemployment of 13% in the West Bank uh, or 45% in Gaza. Israel employs around 100,000 Palestinians from Gaza and the West Bank who must purchase a work permit to commute through militarized checkpoints. Even just the commute can take hours in each direction, partly due to queues under armed surveillance. This has been identified as a significant source of stress to workers even before they arrive at their workplace. At work, Palestinians are often uh, set to unsafe tasks with inadequate safety measures. Uh, so there's an Israeli work monitoring group uh, called Kav Laoved, uh, and they write uh, in a report, quote, the need for Palestinians in the West Bank to support their families leads many who are educated to forego finding work in their profession in the Palestinian Authority and instead look for employment in those sectors open to them in Israel, particularly the construction, agriculture, and industry sectors. 
The unequal power balance makes it impossible for many workers to consider other less dangerous employment options until they get hurt at work. Palestinian workers are often not made aware of the possible specific consequences of risk to their health, often do not feel able to take sick days nominally owed to them, and are not made aware of health services which nominally exist to assist them. While all employed workers are by definition exploited, the exploitation of the Palestinian population is significantly greater thanks to the significantly greater precarity created by political circumstance. Um, the results of a survey that I've, I've shared in the imagery there is uh, from that uh, worker monitoring um, organization. So since Truman's first expression of support, the USA and its allies have stood steadfastly by Israel. And this is despite the Red Cross calling out war crimes, despite the United Nations Special Rapporteur and Amnesty International calling out apartheid, despite Palestinian protests and solidarity protests around the globe. The AUKUS Alliance um, commits Australia and the UK to joint nuclear submarine development, purchase and deployment for decades to come to escalate the potential conflict with China while ignoring domestic issues, including health and well-being. Um, those same countries have for years maintained a united front and made strong statements in support of Israel, denying the Palestinian struggle. The USA has gone even further, sending two aircraft carriers uh, and their strike groups to assist Israel to carry out the genocide while claiming increased military presence is, quote, to prevent the conflict from widening. Omar Rahman. Um, a fellow at the Middle East Council on Global Affairs, correctly describes this nightmare situation. Quote, the US is escalating the situation by bringing in huge naval forces into the region. And it's in a sense of, it, it, sorry, it's in a sense emboldening Israel to carry on what it's doing in Gaza. Historian Bradley Simpson writes for Jacobin that the USA has a long history of downplaying the massacres carried out by its close allies. Uh, we should see this atrocity denialism as the USA deploying its significant national charisma and media power in yet another mass manifestation of imperialism. Meanwhile, in the USA, Jewish protesters against Israel's murder of Palestinians have been arrested while simply expressing a not-in-our-name sentiment. And in the UK, Home Secretary Suella Braverman, uh, Bra Braverman sorry, uh, has threatened that simply waving a Palestinian flag might be considered a criminal offence. While Braverman has also advised police to consider whether chants such as from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, should be understood as an expression of violence and perhaps considered to amount to a racially aggravated public order offence. While New Zealand hasn't gone quite as far as the UK, both of our major parties' leaders have expressed enthusiasm for towing the USA line and supporting Israel no matter what. Several commentators have noted uh, the manner in which the media of AUKUS countries uh, in the West more broadly have not just been complicit in allyship with Israel, uh, but have actually actively manufactured consent for war on the Palestinian civilian population. The concept of manufactured consent is well explained by Herman and Chomsky, um, which is the societal purpose of the media is to inculcate and defend the economic, social, social and political agenda of privileged groups that dominate the domestic society and the state. The media serve this purpose in many ways through selection of topics, distribution of concerns, framing of issues, filtering of information, emphasis and tone, and by keeping debate within the bounds of acceptable premises. The same phenomenon has been identified by Matt Nashed of Al Jazeera, who reports, quote, Palestinians invited to speak to Western news channels are frequently asked if they condemn Hamas, while Israeli guests are seldom asked to con condemn their government's apartheid policies in the occupied West Bank, or at seas, siege and bombardment of Gaza. As Marxists, we understand that um, this is acquiescence to the interests of the ruling class, whether those interests are expressed explicitly or are implicit. Um, but how does this um, support for Israel for further the AUKUS and other Western um, imperial interests? 
There's some suggestion that USA President Truman may have been partially motivated by compassion for the Perry Holocaust plight of um, the Jewish people, although that explanation relies on uh, either a short-sightedness or a lack of care for what the establishment of an exclusive autonomous state, state within a shared land might do to the other people living in that land. A stronger explanation is Truman might have been rushing to consolidate influence in the Middle East ahead of the USA's rival, the Soviet Union at the time, uh, who declared their support for Israel three days later. At the time of that declaration of support, USA presidential advisers recognized the likelihood of alienating existing Arab states and expressed concern that that alienation uh, might threaten access to oil, which the USA valued highly for its war machine. Regardless, since 1948, the presence, expansion, and strengthening of Israel has proved highly useful for Western interests in the region. In the mid-1980s, Israeli whistleblower Vanunu Mordechai uh, revealed to the world that Israel had nuclear weapons, uh, a capability achieved through French nuclear facility construction, German finance, and USA compliance. So the very real threat of nuclear hellfire hangs over the heads of all dissenting Arab nations, thanks in large part to the collaborative efforts of Western powers. By proxy of Israel's immense and ever-growing military threat to its neighbours, Western imperial powers ensure their interests continue to be served in the region. This bolstering of, Israel, uh, of Israeli might is a contemporary example of what Lenin described as, quote, the development and di direct continuation of the fundamental characteristics of capitalism in general. The state of Israel then represents the confluence of imperialism, capitalism, and colonialism. As socialists, we must be against all three of these tools of oppression and their individual and interrelated manifestations. We've supported and we must continue to support the Palestinian people in their struggle for freedom from the crushing boot of the Israeli state. And we must support a free and just future for all people. What does this look like exactly? It means supporting activist groups such as Aotearoa's Justice for Palestine in the education, advocacy and solidarity work. It means boosting the voices of anti-racism and anti-oppression groups such as Alternative Jewish Voices. It means rallying to pressure our governments to acknowledge the oppression of Palestinian people so that our governments might be forced to finally advocate for justice. It means using our own voices to advocate for an outcome in the region that is free from threat and oppression for Jews and Palestinians and everyone alike. It means adding our voices to the rallying cry heard worldwide from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Kia ora.